Coming up on DTNS, the word on the street about Google Stadia. The reviews are out. ByteDance set to take on Spotify and Apple Music. And my, you might want to track your sleep. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, November 18th, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Very happy to have Rob DeMillo, CTO at Skidmore Owings and Merrill LLP, back with us. How's it going, Rob? Very good. Thank you very much for inviting me. I can't wait to talk sleep with you. <laughs> There's so many <laughs> jokes there, but I'm gonna let them all go. I know. I was. I really. That was. That was rude. Because I, I just well, threw that up there, knowing that you would have little... the discretion not to. Yeah, to run with yeah. it. Oh, uh, you should not know that. I know. I know. I shouldn't tempt you. Uh, we had a great time just now talking on Good Day Internet about uh, pergolas and redwood and all kinds of good stuff. If you want to find out that and more, of course, sign up for Good Day Internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. ZDNet reports that some Disney Plus accounts have already been stolen or are being offered for free or for sale on various forums. Some users have had their passwords changed, others didn't. ZDNet suspects that the users either reused passwords from other sites or had been infected with malware previously. Forums have been filled with account credentials for Netflix, Hulu, Prime Video, and others for years. However, the speed at which accounts have been stolen is unusually fast. Mm -hmm. Disney Plus showing how valuable it is by how fast they stole Kinda, yeah. 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 Uh, the messaging app Line and Yahoo Japan have jointly announced a basic agreement on a merger, aiming to finalize the agreement in, in December. The owners of the two companies, SoftBank and Naver, will form a joint holding company with a mutual 50% investment. Yahoo Japan and Line will become subsidiaries. Uh, and investing 340 billion yen to take Line private. As part of the merger, the two companies plan to integrate their business by October 2020, after which it's expected to be Japan's largest internet company by revenue. Zazu Africa Limited announced a partnership with MasterCard to issue prepaid cards li linked to the Zazu Payments app. Zazu lets uh, users in Yambia, Z Zambia rather, send, receive, and pay and save money without needing a bank account. This is a trend. We've been seeing a lot of this. Zazu users will be able to get a contactless physical card as well as a virtual card in the Zazu app. All right. Let's talk a little more about the fate of John Legere. Oh, let's. Hmm. T-Mobile hmm. announced that the current COO, Mike Sievert, will succeed John Legere as CEO <laughs> as of May 1st, 2020. Legere had been expected to step down after the completion of the Sprint T-Mobile merger. Legere was also named CEO back in 2012. He's been there for a while. The Wall Street Journal and CNBC reported that WeWork, which is also a soft bank investment, like Sprint, had talked to Legere about taking over as CEO at that company, according to sources. But Legere said on a conference call Monday, quote, I was never having discussions with to run WeWork. Legere hasn't given an indication of what he plans to do after stepping down as CEO. Meanwhile, Boost Mobile founder Peter Hatterton, I know, it just keeps coming, it's told so Reuters awkward. that he's willing to pay up to $2 billion to build the prepay wireless brand back from Sprint. To buy it, rather. T-Mobile and Sprint uh, agreed to sell Sprint's prepaid mobile networks, including Boost, to Dish Network for $1.4 billion as a condition of that merger. Don't forget, the whole Sprint-T-Mobile merger is still facing a lawsuit from U.S. Attorneys General. So the whole thing is rather in flux. As, as the mobile companies turn. Yeah. Yeah, no Seriously. kidding. So it's probably... So it sounds like Sprint and T-Mobile feel confident about the fact that they will be able to get past the attorney's general lawsuit and that they will then close their merger next year to the point that they just said, you know what, John's going to pick a date, May 1st. He'll be done as of May 1st. Uh, that also implies to me, Rob, and you tell me if I'm uh, over reading the tea leaves, that he does have something set up that he's going to go to. We just yeah. don't know what it is yet, right? There ain't no coincidences in this universe. At yeah. all, yeah. The the the, the rumors of, of him like going to WeWork, coincident with him leaving T-Mobile, and his background being a turnaround artist, <clears throat> just sounds like that's what's going to happen. Well, it all made too much sense until yeah. he said, "I was never having discussions to run WeWork." So that made me think, well, maybe we just maybe this we just have it wrong. This is Legare you're talking about. 
Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll say stuff like that. I was never having discussions to run WeWork. I exactly. was having discussions about being CEO <laughs> of WeWork. <laughs> Or, or I just decided, and I didn't discuss it with them. Yes. Now yeah. I am. Now and I am. Meanwhile, yeah. because of the attorneys general, they haven't closed as fast as possible, so they missed a November 1st deadline. Right. So technically the merger is in renegotiation, Either, even though both parties are still totally fine with it. But because it's in renegotiation, Peter Adderton can then step up and go like, hey, I got $2 billion. I think I want Boost Mobile back after all, uh, uh -huh. which is not an easy transaction because- Dish agreed to get Boost and Virgin and some Spectrum. So even if Sprint were to say, okay, we'll give Boost back to Adderton because he's giving us more money, it could sink the rest of that deal with Dish because Dish may say, well, it's not worth it if we don't get Boost. I forgot all about Dish. Did anyone know anything about Sievert? Not much, I, no. I don't, I don't know a thing about him. I mean, COO, been there for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. But but yeah, but, but largely kind of uh, behind the scenes uh, yeah. character. So yeah. I bet he doesn't curse in his tweets. That's all I am. That would be sad. I know. I I'll would miss make that. Me sad. I, I, <laughs> I can't you know, wait to I, read those new WeWork tweets. Well, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of like Tim Cook and Steve Jobs. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't act like the the guy that everybody knew and loved, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. Or perhaps didn't love. Or yeah, you, that's fair. You know, that's you gotta do like, your own thing. It's so going to be a new like, era. You act, yeah. yeah. You act like the uh, cranky old uncle then? Is that the deal? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what role Seifert wants to fill. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Roger just uh, uh, slacked me that Apple has announced a press event for December 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern because they hate us and want to have a press event in the middle of our broadcast <laughs> day. Here at the ATS. Yeah. Uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, December 2nd in New York City focused on honoring our favorite apps and games of 2019. So may not be like a product announcement thing, uh, may not even be all that much, but uh, interesting and nonetheless, right? I'll be in New York on December 2nd, so we can go tell them to just hold off for 30 minutes. Well, maybe they can honor you. Have you do you have an app <laughs> or a game? No. No, all right. Uh, the reviews for Google Stadia are out uh, one day before it launches for founders on Tuesday, November 19th. And the consensus is works better than expected, but still not quite good enough. Uh, there's some noticeable lag, which is not a problem in slow paced games, but may or may not cause issues on shooters, just depending on how sensitive you are to it. Uh, Ars Technica's Kyle Orland said it worked fine on Ethernet for him, but was inconsistent to the point of aggravation on wife on his Wi-Fi anyway. Uh, most said it kind of feels like a beta. The Verge's Sean Hollister said it felt more reliable than similar services he's tested, but does not compare to a high-end console or PC. And in Gadget's Jessica Condit said, I wouldn't play any of these titles competitively on Stadia, but the service is fine enough for a relaxing evening. Uh, if you don't remember, Google Stadia <laughs> has now upped it. They added some games, so they're going to have 22 games at launch for $130 plus $10 a month plus $20 to $60 per game. It's interesting, uh, the, the whole sort of like, okay, it's not snappy enough for competitive gaming, but it's totally fine for a fun, relaxing evening. Who are the people who want one and not the other? Uh, yeah, I, it, it's a very good question. I mean, mobile gamers, I guess. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, I would probably well, be one of those people who's like, I don't, you know, I don't care about the snappiness necessarily I, if I've got like three games that I like and I want to play a lot. But it just, I, I wonder what, uh, you know, who's going to be diverted from 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 getting Google Stadia knowing, oh, well, it's a little bit sluggish, well, it, even it, if it doesn't actually apply to them. It, it, it's kind of interesting because it well, first first of all, me, like I, I actually do game and, and that millisecond response time is important. But yeah. I, I don't know if you remember, but I was on when Stadia was announced <clears throat> and we, we had talked about it at one point and, and I'm, I'm like Joe streaming guy. Right, so I've been doing doing streaming for years, and I was amazed. I was for the beta was amazing because there was just a few people on it, but I was amazed by the um, sort of overall. Uh, let's just go out there and do it. Attitude of Stadia. It's like because it's hard, like that stuff is hard, and and user managing user complaints when users really don't understand like how streaming 
is affected by all the various mm -hmm. bits and pieces between the server and your game controller. Yeah, they were they're taking a huge gamble, in this, and so is Microsoft by the way coming forward. So it's 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 going to be kind of interesting. I mean, this is the same crowd that was like complaining about that the scenes in Game of Thrones being too dark. It's like, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> I I I think to answer your question, Sarah. Anybody who games on an older Xbox or PlayStation, especially if it's a PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360, which there still are some people, will be fine with this. That's, I, I got a peek at it this weekend, and my feeling was, for me, it's fine. Like, I'm not a competitive gamer. I'm not really attuned to the lag. So those of you who are competitive or think you know, you're competitive are going to notice it, but I imagine most people aren't. What's a bigger problem is what Ars Technica, as Kyle Orland pointed out, and that's to your point, uh, Rob, which is there's something in his Wi-Fi that caused issues that he didn't see in Ethernet. And a lot of people are going to say, hey, this doesn't work. It's your fault, right. even though it may be their router setting or their equipment or something else on their own network slowing it down, because there are so many variables there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's... It... I, I think eventually they're going to work this out. I mean, this is the same problem Netflix had very, very early on. Oh, yeah, that's right? true. People, and they people worked were it out. stuttering and all yeah. that stuff. So, so getting those CDNs in place, and you know, they've got the they've got the buck to do it. So, uh, moving on, Microsoft confirmed that it will remove the Cortana app from the iOS and Android app stores on January 31st in the UK, Australia, Germany, Mexico, China, Spain, Canada, and India. A Microsoft spokesperson told The Verge that currently the app is still supported in the U.S., however. Microsoft said it plans to further integrate Cortana into Office 365. We talked about that in the past. The company did not reveal how devices that use the Cortana app for configuration and firmware updates, like the Surface <coughs> headphones, would work in those selected markets. It should be easy enough to just build Cortana into the Surface headphone uh, system. It's going to stay on Windows, uh, yeah. First of all, so uh, and, yeah, Microsoft, just, Microsoft said they want... just done a whole push into the fact that they're like, this is just going to be a Windows. Um... Yeah, Microsoft has said they just want it to be their voice assistant in software like Office 365. Uh, so it doesn't shock me that that it would take away the app, but they will have to migrate a few things like settings uh, to two other situations that should easily be done. This honestly doesn't surprise me. It just shows that, you know, Microsoft is saying we are seeding that front end of the market but we will still continue to use our voice recognition services as, as an enterprise service, which is where they make their money these days. Yeah, that's reasonable. I'm actually a little uh, disappointed that I didn't use Cortana a little bit more on iOS before it got yanked. Uh, just because, you know, I like yeah. to sort of know how the assistants work. I still think that Google's assistant is way better than Siri. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, Amazon's assistant is a whole other thing, but, but Cortana, I don't have a lot of experience with. I, hey. I, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. No, I, and the, 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 I wonder what the motivation really is to do. I like, is there a partnership somewhere in the works with Google and Microsoft or Amazon and Microsoft? And there's, that's why there's, they're, well, there is a partnership this? with Amazon already and they'd like yeah. a partnership with Google. So yeah. But for the voice assistant for the, yeah. Yeah, Cortana okay. is integrated well, there you with, go. with. Oh with yeah, yeah, sure. that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right, that's right. So that, yeah, that yeah. might actually be part of the. I'm sure that's part of the calculation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, in the end, hey, Cortana, we'll miss you. Thank you. <laughs> Logitech announced the Adaptive Gaming Kit designed to work with the Xbox Adaptive Controller to make gaming more accessible to those with disabilities. The kit includes three small buttons, three large buttons, four light touch buttons, and two variable trigger controls that connect to the Adaptive Controller over three and a half millimeter jacks and USB and can be mapped to different functions for Xbox and PC games. It also includes both rigid and foldable game mats with Velcro ties for laying out the buttons. The Adaptive Gaming Kit was developed in partnership with the Able Gamers Charity, the Abilities Research Center at Mount Sinai and Special Effect and costs $99.99. That's a big advancement uh, for this. And Microsoft's been doing a lot in the accessibility space. So it's good to see them continue, especially in gaming, uh, to, to make these available. Yeah. I... I don't know, Rob. What do you think of the what do you think of the price point? That's about right. I mean it, it's $99. I mean a new controller is what, 60 bucks or something? Like a yeah, like a not like yeah. a non adaptive controller, so sixty dollars to so thirty dollars for the accessibility option. I mean, it's a uh, unfortunate. Go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say that uh, compared to the old adaptive or like um, uh, controllers that they used to create that were very special and uh, 
specialized and very console specific. I mean, a hundred bucks is super cheap. I mean, those things used to be like three hundred dollars back in yeah. back of the Xbox three hundred and sixty days and before. Well, this is what? just the gaming kit. Keep keep that in mind. Yeah. You, it's it works with the Xbox adaptive controller, but you'll still need that controller separately to the hundred dollars. Yeah, it's it's still kind of okay. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a target market that's very small, right? And so you make up for that by you have to ratchet up the the price, unfortunately. So it, all things considered, it's actually not bad. Well, especially because uh, because the target market is small, a lot of times people who have accessibility needs just don't have an option, just don't yeah. have a product. So yeah. it's it's good to at least see that. The Financial Times reports that ByteDance, perhaps you've heard of it, is in talks with Warner Music, Universal Music, and Sony Music to secure move, uh, music streaming rights and plans to launch a music streaming service as early as next month. This is according to sources. Listeners would be able to search through a library of short vertical video clips designed for mobile phones and then sync these songs as they listen, the service would reportedly cost less than ten dollars per month and initially launch in Brazil, Indonesia, and India. Yeah, we went round and round in our pre-show about this, like because that vertical video clip thing seems like they're trying to take some of their TikTok product and force it in. It's filtered through sources. So my experience is a lot of time these things end up being a lot less weird when they actually become public than they sound when some source is kind of talking through the side of their mouth uh, about it. Uh, but I think what is significant is that ByteDance, which has a huge and growing market with TikTok worldwide, uh, can get those people to move over to a fairly affordable service in areas of the world where they can be competitive, like Brazil, Indonesia, and India. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, you, you know, when we were talking through this earlier, you know, I was like, this is going to be like TikTok video stuff. And you were like, no, no, that's not what this is. Um, but that's, you know, immediately where my mind went to. And the fact that it would reportedly be less than $10 per month leads me to believe it would be a more restricted library. Because mm. otherwise, why wouldn't you just, you know, have it at a competitive level? Because well, you look have at so the many markets users anyway. It. The, long, the markets they're launching in are markets where less than $10 a month is a kind of an average price It's the right place, yeah. yeah. And Brazil, Indonesia, and India is all, it's also very, um, it's, uh, it, that's, you know, they're not doing that on accident. It's, it's, it's that's definitely That's where you see, where, like, the, real, the really cheap Netflix, uh -huh. you know, the, the, the mobile-only version of Netflix is in India. That's one of the test markets it launched in, uh, places like that. I, I do see if, if this starts taking off in, in places where they can maybe get a groundswell, uh, ByteDance could become a player uh, on the scene with Apple and Spotify. I, yeah, I think it's easy uh, for, I don't know, someone like me who's, you know, I'm <laughs> Apple Music. Many people are Spotify or, or there are other options, obviously, but those are the two biggest players to be like, ah, we've, we've got enough. We have enough of these. But if somebody comes in at a lower price point and is just as good, Who's gonna, you know, who's gonna move over, or who's going to sign up for a ByteDance service? Who didn't with the others? Yeah, my, my my first reaction to this is that one. It's like, oh, thank God, another streaming service. <laughs> Phew, that that's great. But yeah. <laughs> but but then yeah, I woke up this morning and and one of my VC channels that I, that I subscribe to is chattering away with. Um, they think this is directly putting Spotify in the crosshairs. Like it, it's a deliberate attempt to try and bring Spotify's market share down. Yeah, but uh, I could see that, especially because Spotify is stronger in in areas of the world that Apple Music hasn't really right. caught on in. So, yeah. Yep. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Sleep trackers, a lot of them exist. Uh, they exist in a lot of different ways. There's standalone devices, standalone devices that do particular things, obviously part of your general wearable watch or fitness tracker. And they generally measure things like <coughs> sleep duration, uh, sleep quality, the phases of your sleep, environmental factors like light and temperature, even lifestyle items like when you last ate or how much caffeine you've been drinking. Alan Schwartz, MD, director of the Sleep Disorders Center at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, pointed out that none of them actually measure sleep directly that would require brainwave monitoring but infer sleep tracking from other data but he says they can still give you data to reflect on as long as you realize the limits of what they can tell you and they can still tell you a lot rob i know you've been using sleep as an android and an oximeter to track yeah. your sleep uh what got you interested in this form of self-measurement what have you found out uh self-centered interest actually so so i 
I snore quite a bit. And, and I, I started to notice the older that I got, the, uh, uh, the, I would start to wake up as tired as when I went to bed, mm-hmm. which, it, which was just not cool, by the way, just in general. So well, the point I, of sleep I, is that you wake up less tired. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was, I was trying to figure out what I what was doing. Right. And so I started screwing around with all this stuff back in the Fitbit days, um, early Fitbit days. And so I, you know, use their silly little, you've rolled over, you haven't rolled over thing. And I could see that I wasn't restless. So that kind of led to more and more things. And I, and I got on the trail of, of, of sleep as Android, which I don't think Sarah and Tom, you tell me this, it doesn't exist on iOS, does it? No. Uh, okay. Not no. as far as I and, know. And, and, and as, aside from having the world's most awkward name for an app, um, it, it became <laughs> more and more, um, complex as to what they could do with it yeah, to the point now where it's like you can you can uh, if your bed partner also has sleep as android they'll talk to each other and uh when they're looking for snoring and things like that they'll they can figure out which one of you is doing it oh, interesting. Uh, like right now like, <laughs> i feel like, like right you'd now, be like it's you because well, you're keeping yeah, me up <laughs> part of my but, problem i think oh, yeah. my, I think my dog is actually triggering my thing, but, um, uh, so you need one for the dog too. Yeah, yeah exactly. So as, uh, as the app has increased in power, uh, and phones have increased in sensors, it's, it's doing more and more interesting things. So, um, it, it's not just detecting snoring anymore. It's, it's also, uh, looking for light level changes, uh, pressure changes, um, vibrations, that sort of thing. Uh, and it, it was showing a clear pattern for me that, that, um, there was problems with the way I was sleeping. And I, uh, I, I've gotten to the point now where I'll, I'll sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night jarred awake because I, I think I have, um, gone into sort of this weird oxygen deprivation situation because of the snoring. Mm-hmm. So then that started getting me interested in oximeters. And, and so there's one, there, there were several on the market. Um, and sleep is Android allows integration with some of these things. And, and, uh, so the one that I picked, um, and uh, is this, <laughs> this really ugly, like, <clears throat> so, so this, there, there's a company called, and I, I'm not making this up happy electronics that makes this, this pulse, uh, uh, oximeter. And it comes with um, a dongle that you plug in at the end here. And, and this little blue thing that you put on your wrist doesn't really do anything at all. So it goes, uh, it goes around your wrist. Yeah, it goes it's, around your that's, wrist. But... That's how it's identifying what you're doing. No, 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 no. It goes around the wrist to hold the battery and the little oh. and, and whatever else is in there. This is actually the sensor. There's no sensors on the blue itself. On the well, blue so thing. why does it have to be on, around your wrist at all? Um, I think cause the other option is what you have something dangling off the bed or you, or you do anything. Sure. Oh, um, <laughs> on your person seems or, it, it <laughs> slightly does, it, more invasive, but okay. And, and to your point, there are some problems with this. Um, I, if, you know, if, it, cause this is on my finger, you put this on your finger and then this goes on your wrist like, like that. And mm, if, mm-hmm. if, if I put my hand under the pillow or whatever, you know, that happens. Sure. And, and when that happens, it cuts the connection to the application and the application is not robust enough to understand that, that that's what has just occurred. And so it wipes out your data for the night uh, for this thing. But when it does record, um, the results are kind of interesting. You, you've got a um, – there's a measure of oxygen – uh, intake that uh, is rated between zero and a hundred and you're supposed to be in 90 to a hundred, uh, you know, that, that percentile when, when you're, when you're sleeping and I clearly dip below. So one of the things this does do, um, even if you're not on sleep as Android is it will, um, beep or vibrate to wake you up if you drop below 90, uh, so that you can, you can get back to the point and, and it's had some effect. I have to say like the, it's so kind of the, like, the digital version of nudging someone when they stop breathing. Yeah, while that's that's asleep. exactly. That's yeah. exactly. And I've seen some very, compl- over. I've seen yeah. some very complicated versions of these things where, um, there, there's one, I just came across it the other night. Uh, and I, and I apologize. I don't have the, the, um, the name of the company, but it, essentially there's a vibratory strip that you put in your pillow. And then there is a box there to your point that you put on the side of the bed and the cable runs from the pillow to the, the thing on the side of the bed. Uh, and it, it, 
vibrates the pillow to do that nudge thing to to, to wake you up. If, it's if you, it's uh, funny, Rob. You mentioned you know Fitbit at the you know uh, beginning of the segment, and I'm wearing a Versa two. I wear okay. it at night. I I mean this thing is on me unless I'm in the shower. It's on <laughs> me all the time. And in the morning, I I'm always sort of like, how did I sleep? The thing is though, is like. And there are a lot, again, there are a lot of metrics going into yep. what what it decides, you know, how I slept. You know, this was your REM, this was your deep, this was, you know, sort of your rest, restless period. But it is not accurate. No. There will, there will be a night where I'm like, I slept like garbage. You mm-hmm. know, I was like, you know, tossing and turning or Otis was snoring or the cat was around, you know, like – whole thing and fit would be like you got seven hours of sleep and i'm like "Uh uh-uh no i didn't so you don't know that i was up so i feel like it is we're getting to the point where this uh information is is helpful especially when you're like i'm trying to pinpoint a problem but it's not really accurate as far as because like how how do they know you know like if i'm laying awake like silently they think i'm sleeping i wasn't sleeping yeah yeah, and if you're not moving, it shows that way too. I mean, th- that's why I stopped using Fitbit because the inference patterns on um, uh, on Fitbit are uh, immature, I think, compared to something like Sleep as Android. Sleep as Android has, because it's got an open API, it plugs into a lot of things. So it does plug into my Google Fit. It plugs into um, some exercise apps that I use uh, and a bunch of other things, and they share information back and forth. And the inference that it makes, it feels a little better to me. So it'll give me a, uh, it won't give me a sleep rating score. It'll say your deep sleep was 85% of your evening and, and restless sleep was 15% and that kind of thing. And then it feeds into an overall um, uh, sleep lag monitor. So it shows you based off your age and your weight and your exercise levels, how much sleep you should be getting uh, on a, on a nightly basis and how much you are and what's your deficit or how much are you over and all that stuff. So, so the information is there, uh, but to Sarah's point, not sure it's any better, uh, you know, it's finer resolution does not mean that the data is better, but right. yeah, it's data that you look at and you go like, all right, there's a problem. What's mm-hmm. my solution? Right. <laughs> we're kind of we're kind of still working to get to that point. Yeah. Uh, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. If you have sleep uh, solutions, please submit them. Submit all stories that you care about that you'd like us to see and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also join in on our conversation on Discord. It's a lively one. Lots of good friends to meet there. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, has website has a website that you can use to avoid places that charge resort fees. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler Can't with another yet, Tech in Travel sure Minute. I don't know if you've had this happen where you check into a hotel that you have prepaid for a hotel room and they say, oh, yes, by the way, there's a resort fee. If you want to use the fitness center, the pool, or even the Wi-Fi, we're going to charge you $40 a day. It has happened to me as it has happened to many people. There is a bill being proposed in the U.S. Congress that would outlaw it in the U.S., but in the meantime, Expedia, one of the largest online travel agents in the world, has said that all things being equal, they're going to rank lower hotels that have hidden fees. Way to go, Expedia. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I apologize for interrupting you, Chris, but that's good information. It definitely is. Uh, shout out to our patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels, including... James P. Callison, Wandy Hernandez, and Jonathan Price. Also, extra special thanks to Rob DeMillo for being with us today. Rob, it's been too long. It so nice to have long. you on the show. Uh, let oh. folks know where they can keep up with, with, with the rest of your work. You keep up with me. I mean, if you look at my uh, About Me page, About Me, Rob DeMillo, you'll see all my stuff, uh, where to get my Twitter and my Instagram and, and where I'm working now and what happened to my previous job and all that good stuff. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, everyone, for interest in our upcoming listener co-host episode that we'll be recording for the holiday break. Uh, We got so many good submissions. Uh, As always, more good submissions than we will be able to fit in the show. So if you hear from us, that means you're on the show. If you don't hear from us, it means you're not. Uh, But if we 
didn't get reach out to you. It's not because your submission wasn't great. We just had too many to pick from. So please, if you don't get on this year's show, uh, send us an email about it again next year. And of course, uh, don't forget, we have holiday cards coming out with Len Peralta Art. You got to sign up for our Patreon or stay on our Patreon by November 28th. And if you want to make sure you get a holiday card, you have to give us your mailing address. We, we can't guess what it is. So go to patreon.com slash pledges to make sure that Daily Tech News Show has access to your correct address. If you have feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That is 21.30 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>